Um, I don't know if you've seen this debate pop up from time to time on the internet, but I figured I'd ask a, a true authority on the subject. Which of the office characters, if any, do you think would have voted for Donald Trump? So we're at South by Southwest. Do you want to set the scene? We're in an auditorium. It looks like there's about 9,000 people, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Nine, 10,000? Yeah, Nine or 10,000 right. people, yeah. It's, it's amazing. I could barely hear on the way in. <laughs> oh. um, welcome to Offline. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours. You know, like, like most people who aren't monsters, I'm a huge fan of your shows. Um, I want to start with Upload because, uh, A, I believe the second season is out today. Today. Yes. Which is amazing. Uh, and, and B, so this podcast is about all the ways the internet is breaking our brains. And you've created a show about how the internet may be able to upload our brains to a virtual afterlife of our choosing in the not so distant future, which I think raises a few questions. Um, just to start, can you tell the story about what inspired the idea for Upload and how it ultimately became a series? Sure, sure. So, okay, so cast your mind back to um, late 80s. Uh, I am a writer on Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. and I'm walking around midtown Manhattan uh, from our offices in 30 Rock, trying to think of sketch ideas, and walking past all the electronic stores that are advertising CD players, which have come out. And they're all talking about, you know, your, your entire music library digitized, um, you know, digital, digital. And so I'm trying to exaggerate that in my head as you are wont to do when you're making a sketch. And I'm like, well, what else could you digitize? Da, da, da. So, you know, I'm thinking, well, you can digitize all of your, your personality and your memories, and, and then maybe you would be in a, in a game environment or some sort of Tron-like you know, thing. I mean, the, this, these ideas were around a lot, but the, the thing that I realized was that it would be a way for uh, human beings to create their own heaven. Um, you know, for obviously thousands of years, people have wondered what would it be like after we're, we're dead? You know, what are the attributes of that place? And this, this would be a chance to actually create it. And yet, if people created it, would it really be heaven? It would probably not. It would probably be very unfair and have all the ills of societies right. that we actually create, right? So I was like, oh, that's a really cool idea to explore a lot of things. It's, it's not a sketch for SNL. The church lady's not in it. So, you know, I can't use it today. But so I it went into the trunk of writer ideas. And then we had a, a strike in 2008, um, which was over digital issues. Uh, the writers, you know, if you may recall, went on strike so that work would be covered if it was uh, streamed. And I had a lot of free time, and I started making it as a book, because mm -hmm. you weren't allowed to write during that other than uh, you know, uh, prose. So I was developing it as a book, but then we went back to work. And then when the office was finally done, um, I went to my trunk, and I got this idea out, and I started developing it for, at that point, for a streamer. And uh, Amazon uh, eventually ended up with it. And basically, they were like, make a TV series which just feels like a five-hour movie. And so that was the marching orders. And, uh, and at that, by that point, you know, there were six giant tech companies that were running everything in the world. And, um, uh, and my kids were playing a game called Club Penguin. And, uh, <laughs> And so my daughter comes up to me and says, Dad, I need 99 cents to buy a digital TV to put in my igloo. And I was like, you, so wait, you need real money <laughs> to buy a little black square that you're going to stick, you know. So I realized that um, if there ever was a digital afterlife that people were uploaded into, that those six tech companies that would run six different ones would, you know, charge you endlessly for in-app purchases. and. Uh, and then it started to sound very funny, and so it became this sort of comedy. I do love the, the companies that you picked to be fully consolidated running yeah. this near future in 2033, like Panera finally yeah. figured it out. Panera Bread is, is dominant. They bought Facebook, and 
Uh, <laughs> they pretty much own everything. Oscar Mayer uh, yeah, also came and out Intel on merged in the future. That was big. Yeah. I so. heard you I heard you pitch the show as a romantic comedy, satiric, sci-fi, philosophical murder mystery. How'd that go over? Well, that was a good <laughs> laugh in the beginning of the pitch, you know. <laughs> but nervous laugh or <laughs> <laughs> But I, what I was thinking was, there's so many TV shows, and I was like really into, um, uh, probably when I was pitching it, maybe Game of Thrones. Uh, mm. But I, I felt like in order to cut through, you had to have a very intense connection to the show. And um, I also like Bollywood films, you know? And yeah. the, one of the things I like about a good Bollywood film is they take the attitude that you're probably only going to see one movie a year, so we're just going to make sure it hits every box for you. <laughs> you know, there's going to be songs and a love story and yeah. action and comedy. So I try to pack everything into it, and uh, you know, this is the result. Uh, I should say that I absolutely I love the show. Um, Thank you. My wife Emily and I binged both seasons in like a week, uh, and my first reaction was to start googling to figure out just how much is science and how much is fiction. And I came across this Atlantic piece from 2016 with the headline, Why You Should Believe in the Digital Afterlife. And it was written by a professor of neuroscience. Um, how deep did you get into the scientific research about the potential to transfer our consciousness to a computer? Um, well, we, I have done a lot of research. Um, so the, the show has two parts, right? Because it's set in the year 2034. And so a lot of the characters who are alive are walking around in futuristic New York or LA. And then there's also this very designed um, metaverse experience, there are six of them that the different tech companies are hosting. And um, the tech company in our show is called Horizon, which is kind of hilarious, yeah. <laughs> since uh, Facebook turned around and named their new portal uh, Horizon. But, um, and they host a, a, a a luxurious uh, afterlife based on the Mohunk Mountain House Hotel in upstate New York. That's what it looks like. It's like a very sort of Victorian Ralph Lauren type of vibe. Um, and so to do, uh, to come up with a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of research went into the tech and the, the, that is present in 2034 real world. And, um, uh, some of them are more fanciful, but a lot of them are just like going to CES uh, and figuring out what's coming and then pretending it's now pervasive and everybody has one. That's what you guys did? For a lot of it, yeah. The upload, specifically the tech of upload, I actually, the more research I did, the less I think it's coming <laughs> in any sort of time frame that I'll be able to make use of. But I'm hoping that, um, <laughs> I'm hoping that by doing this show, that Amazon will see some kind of benefit in actually making the the uh, technology in time. For no, that that was that was my purpose in Googling. I was like, wait, am I going to be able to do this? Yeah, going right. to happen in our lifetime. And so, of course, the Atlantic got me. I clicked on the piece and so I'm, read it. So I'm encouraged by the fact that they think it's possible. So this professor said that he thinks it is probably not. It's like decades, decades away, but yeah. he thinks that it could well, happen. But he was also saying that like. You know, first you have to make a, a copy of the human brain. Yeah, and you have to know how the brain works. Which you have to know is, the brain works. Pretty far away from that. Pretty yeah. far from that. Then you have to copy the human brain onto a computer, and then the amount of computing power it takes is enormous, which you guys reference in the show. Yeah. Um, how much it would cost to do all that computing, and then you know, there's the element of, which is more of a philosophical question: Is it really you? if you could exactly copy your brain and transfer, transfer yeah. it to a computer, and then you die, what is that, what is that copy? Well, one of the things that makes it so fun to work on this show is that there are so many philosophical yeah. questions that are raised by it. Um, and uh, you know, I, the, the thing that attracted to me at the beginning was the idea of, oh, this will be a way to sort of comment on s human society through the means of a of actually believing that we made our own heaven. What, what choices would we make, you know, and how would it be unfair, and et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm seeing now is that people are making societies. That's what, you know, making a metaverse is. And you have to come up with the rules of those new worlds that are being created digitally 
And so now the show actually feels more like it's about this metaverse creation process than, yeah. than too much else. Well, and you alluded to this, but you know, a big theme of Upload is inequality. Yeah. You know, so in the show you can live uh, in a luxury digital afterlife if you're rich. You can live in a, in a fairly low rent afterlife if you're not. The two gigs. That's, two gigs. It's yeah. Called, yeah. And then and some people. Just for people who don't know that what that <laughs> what that is is, you know, you've been uploaded, but now you you can't make the the payments, and so you are downgraded to two gigs worth of data per month. And when you use up your two gigs, you just freeze until the beginning of the next month. <laughs> And then some people can't afford to be uploaded at all. Yeah, it's funny because you guys, ha it, you know, there's a, a protest movement in the um, in, in passing in one of the episodes, and when people are starting to chant, you know, uploading should be a right, not a privilege. Yeah. In that Atlantic piece, they envisioned that if they did this someday, it would be about who can pay because of all the computation yeah. uh, that will the, the power that it will require to pay for. And they said, yeah, probably a slogan would end up being. Uh, is it a right? And, yeah, uh, and universal digital afterlife <laughs> is something that what, people are why did, for. Why, did, why was it so important for you guys to focus on the relationship between inequality and technology? Well, I mean, when you think about a, a for-profit heaven, like, <laughs> it, it, uh, it's pretty much baked in. I mean, it goes back to, like, selling indulgences, you know, like the start of... of um, Protestantism as a reaction to uh, the idea that rich people could just buy their way into heaven in 1400 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so that's how long I've been working on the show. Uh, <laughs> 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 but I mean, the the actual thing is, it's not like this, um, you know, uh, preachy treatise on uh, on capitalism. Uh, it's a love story between, uh, you know, a man who. It gets into a, a self-driving car accident and is uploaded in his late 20s, which uh, very unexpectedly, and he's on the account of his girlfriend, who's a pretty shallow uh, person in LA. Um, so he's pretty much dependent on her for everything. But then he, he ends up falling in love with a much more grounded person who works in, uh, uh, as a customer service rep and she lives in New York, and she's pretty much working at Upload to try and take advantage of the employee discount so she can upload her dad, who has vape lung, which <laughs> is uh, a deadly condition of people who vape in the future. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I love about the show is because it's set in 2033, uh, and you were saying you guys you know, went to CES to try to get some of this stuff, but a lot of this futuristic tech stuff you have in the show is just sort of a logical extension of what we have now, yeah. um, but maybe a little darker, right? Like everything's a little, there's self-driving cars that you can set on either uh, protect passenger or protect, uh, protect passenger, protect pedestrian, yeah. right? Because <laughs> um, you can have a choice apparently. There's, uh, the people get food from 3D printers because it's hard to grow food in this, yeah. in this future. Well, Monsanto has all of the the uh, seeds and everything under contract. We <laughs> there's a cut scene in season one where Nora goes down an alley in New York and uh, pays cash for something in a bag. This is this didn't air, but and it turns out to be a green pepper, uh, which she like greedily eats. But it's like it's actually grown instead of printed, and so it tastes a lot better. And then she tries to plant all the seeds. And then later you see this drone from the Monsanto company come <laughs> along and laser beam all the seeds dead <laughs> so they can keep their intellectual property. There's, and there's also um, you know, a, a Tinder now. You can, yes. you can rate people after you've had sex with them. Yeah, That's our version of Tinder on the show is called Nightly. And um, <laughs> after every Nightly experience, you, you give a, like a, a Uber rating to the person you hooked up with. <laughs> Which is another thing that sort of, in a way, has happened. Like China has that yeah. sort of social credit thing now. Yeah, there. exactly. Um, what I'd say that it's like dystopian, but it, a lot of this is comedic. A lot of these elements. Yes, yeah, so like, we, we, I talk about this actually to the crew. Okay. This was a big thing because um, I, I wanted to make sure that it, it didn't. It isn't dystopian, and it's not utopian. It's some uh, comical mix of them, and I would. Uh, maybe put out the word anoitopia, 
<laughs> which is uh, uh, based on a Greek word for idiot. Uh, but um, but yeah, I think that's that's you know to me as a comedy writer when you look at the world, the most powerful law is the law of unintended consequences more than the law of gravity because just every time anybody thinks that something's going to go one way, it seems to in include stuff that you didn't count on. Like, oh, wow, we're, I'm going to be able to, you know, connect with all the people, all my friends from high school. And then, wait a minute, what happened to journalism and democracy? <laughs> like, yeah, right. somehow, somehow that got lost. Yeah, I wanted to make friends, and now, <laughs> yeah. right. Now so the there's a lot of those kind of things. So, yeah, so I think in the, in the future, um, if things can malfunction comedically, they often do in our show. <laughs> um, we, we've talked on, on this show about how being extremely online affects or the quality of our friendships and, and relationships. The romance at the heart of Upload is between Nathan, who's in the digital afterlife, uh, and, and Nora, who's still living. What did you want to say about how technology changes or doesn't change the way we interact with one another, have relationships, have friendships? Um, yeah, it's a big, it's definitely a big topic. And it's interesting because um, the character Nora is very pro-technology. And Andy Allo, who's the actress that, that plays Nora, you know, we started um, promoting season one just when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And she was remarkably um, grateful for Zoom because she lived alone. And that was like her connection to everybody. And, huh. you know, she felt that, that this was a, a, a great technology and that for her to fall to find the person she's in love with, even though that they're digital, but still be able to interact because, you know, she puts on her VR goggles and goes into the world and they talk to each other. You know, from my standpoint as a writer, you know, having written uh, the Jim and Pam romance, uh, yeah. I'm always conscious of where are the obstacles, right? Because once you get rid of all the obstacles, they pretty much should, should get together. And, so this is like a really good obstacle, the fact that he <laughs> has no dating, body. <laughs> dating someone's digital consciousness. Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a tough one. And it also, but it also sort of like romantic, I think, because it's, you know, they're, they're communing on a pretty uh, uh, personality-oriented, you know, um, plane. Yeah. As opposed to physical. No, I did, it's interesting because for all the downsides of technology and you show many of them over the course of the series it, it I, do, I do think it says something more hopeful about sort of the ability to connect with other human beings through technology than even we might experience today I mean it's it's interesting hearing that about um, Andy Allo at the beginning of the pandemic because I do remember at the beginning of the pandemic thinking thank God we have this technology to connect with other people. Thank God we can do Zooms. And then two years in, right. you're, as I'm you're sitting there like going, scrolling Zoom. on my phone yeah. on Twitter, and I'm like, God, I just need real human connection. This is horrible. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like one of the things, another scene that is a deleted scene is um, Nathan's first Thanksgiving with his family where he's being passed around on an iPad. Yeah. And, um, and his niece is talking to him and her mom just comes by and says no more screen time and turns it off <laughs> and doesn't know that she's talking to her her uncle um, <laughs> so yeah there's uh, uh, I think it's you know I think everybody's had that experience of um, you know just getting lost in in the screens and forgetting about the real world for a while and yeah yeah so I will admit something I heard about upload when the first season dropped last year I was fascinated by the premise but I couldn't watch it because I have always had this like paralyzing fear about what happens to us after we die. And when I finally watched a few weeks ago, it actually made me feel better. Um, not because I expect to be uploaded. Again, my hopes were dashed. H has creating this show shaped your own personal view of mortality or immortality? Like, has it, has it made you think differently? Or what were you thinking heading into it? Well, the show is is not supernatural at all, right? There's nothing. Right. Uh, it's pretty much science fictiony, where everything is very plausible, and um, you know, there's uh, an explanation, whether it's you know BS or not. But the, yeah. the explanation of how it works is in there, uh, and so you know, um, 
I feel like it's, it's, a, uh, it's like a medical procedure, kind of, you know? Because there's a, there's a moment in the pilot where Nora is trying to stop Nathan from jumping into the torrent, which is like the, the data stream that connects the digital world to the, and that's like how they would, they would uh, end it all. And because he's just completely weirded out. And a, a big thing is just like in the pilot is, is it's, there's a transitional period where you realize that you're only digital and it's, and it's everything starts to feel phony and weird. And right. So, and she's really arguing for him to accept that if his, consciousness is still around, then he's still around. Like, I think therefore I am, and, and, um, and that this is just a way to, you know, keep, keep going. What, whatever it is that we perceive, if our memories and our consciousness are intact, then we're, we're good. Um, so, you know, to me, I think it would be a positive if we could, you know, do it. It seems like it. I, I, I found it interesting, too, when, um, you know, Nora's father basically tells her, he doesn't want to join her in the digital afterlife because he'd rather be with her mother who passed away um, in the real afterlife. And, you know, she treats his faith as this obviously silly belief in fantasy. Well, she's a little personally offended because he's basically saying, I would rather be with the memory of my wife than be able to actually talk to you. <laughs> right. So she's a little annoyed as a daughter. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's part of season two, actually, because, um, well, I don't, I don't, uh, it's, it's out there, so you can see it. <laughs> spoilers, <laughs> yeah, spoilers. At the end of season one, um, Nathan uh, has finally realized he loves Nora, has broken up with Ingrid, which means he's no longer on her uh, credit account at, at Lakeview, so he's downgraded to two gig status, which we were talking about. Um, and... Uh, uh, and Nora, uh, and there's also, uh, I have to re remind you that one of the genres is murder mystery. So that comes right. into play here as well. And um, uh, Nora has to kind of go on the lam and she, she's taken in by the protest movement uh, who are against upload. And, um, and they're like a weird uh, collection of different factions. There's a religious faction that doesn't want any upload because they, they believe, like her dad, that it's some kind of sacrilege. And then there's a, a faction that uh, doesn't like upload for the rich and wants universal upload and is also trying to destroy Lakeview because of, from a different perspective. So she's up, up in the woods with those guys when we begin season two. Yeah. It does, it just sets up a, a, a fascinating philosophical question, like, which the show does so many. Um, that if you knew that it was possible to live forever in a digital afterlife, would you still hold on to your faith in a real afterlife if that's what you've had your whole life? It's, a, it's whether it's a belief in God or what religion you have. But yeah, that's a that's a tough. Well, you know, the very first version of this show was actually before the Amazon version. I I sold it to HBO a couple of years earlier, and uh -huh. in that version, the the different afterlives were run by different religions. Oh. Yeah, and, um, and it's very interesting because this morning I was at a, a panel here at, at South by Southwest about the metaverse, and they were talking about, you know, are we going to recreate all the problems of Web 2.0 in terms of, you know, big corporations running everything, and couldn't there be some kind of, um, you know, public access uh, uh, metaverse or something like that? And I was really reminded of this, the first version of the show where, like, the Catholic Church would run their own their own digital afterlife, and it would be according to whatever you believed in as a Catholic. That's the rules you'd get in that digital afterlife. And if you believed in a different form of heaven, well, that religion would host a different version. And you, yeah. So I don't know. That's a different version of the show. But no, I think that I, I mean the the smartest point in the whole show is that whatever, because it's designed by humans. A digital afterlife is going yeah. to have all of the same problems that humanity has, yeah. and at the and at the core of humanity, the problem is you know Green. scarce resources yeah. and inequality and people fighting over that. Yeah. Um, what uh, without giving too much away, I know it was uh, renewed for season three. Well, actually, we're we're we have a writing room. You're for writing season three. three. We're still waiting to hear. Yes. Yeah, so. What other themes are you looking to explore? Uh, well, there's a. We tend to end the episodes and the seasons on some sort of cliffhanger. So there's an implication of how we end season two at 
really suggests a lot of season three. Mm. I'll just say that. Okay, we'll leave it there. Then. <laughs> I was trying to get something out of you. But. Uh, I want to ask you about The Office. Um, Emily and I have, have watched every episode multiple times. We're clearly not alone. The Office is the world's most streamed television show by nearly 20 billion minutes. Um, it was arguably a bigger success on Netflix than it was on, on NBC when it, where it first aired. Do you have a theory as to, as to why, why that is? Um, you know, when you said billions, I just saw that sign for McDonald's that says billions and billions served. We're all served, yeah. <laughs> We've all been served by the uh, Yeah, so right. I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, listen, we had an absolute ball making that show. I think the format was great. I think I was super lucky in the writers that I hired and the cast that I managed to, to get. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it, it is a repeatable experience. Uh, uh, in the current uh, TV landscape, but um, yeah, I don't know, man. Everybody seemed to love it, so yay. I mean, you have two shows on on streaming services uh, now. You used to write for networks. How does the different format change the storytelling and the comedy? Um, well, like I was saying, that for upload, we were trying to make a five-hour movie. Mm -hmm. That was the the marching orders, and um, so that's pretty different from. Uh, 28 episodes a year or something, which is what The Office was like. Um, and the production process is very different. Like, it takes two years to do, or it, it took a year and 10 months, to, you know, I guess the, the pandemic was in there, but to do this second season. And there's just a lot of um, visual effects and post-production and the way they like to do it, they, you know, you have the whole season written before you start shooting mm -hmm. and then you shoot and then you edit. and. Whereas a traditional network model, you know, you might be six episodes ahead at any one point, and then you're continuously editing, and you have a much bigger writing staff, and you know, so it's just a pretty different model. This is actually closer to how I think British TV is done. You know, like the original Office had two six-episode seasons with a Christmas special, and then it was done, and they pretty much wrote the entire thing themselves. Uh, Which do you enjoy doing more? I don't know, you know, you can't go back in time, right? So I'm happy <laughs> what, where what, I am. <laughs> what feels like more work? Well, you know, strangely, this feels maybe like more work because I, uh, I, I work longer at, with, that, with fewer mm -hmm. uh, staff, maybe. Um, but obviously, uh, there was just a tonnage issue of more minutes before. What do you think the future looks like for network comedies? And, and, and how long do you think that future exists? Well, uh, the first show that I've watched on a network in a really long time is this show, The Cleaning Lady, that's on. Mm -hmm. I just started watching that. That's pretty good. But I, <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen a show that came from network TV in years. So I don't know if network now is the same as network then. But when you look at streamers now, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that's the number one shows on the streamers are old network shows. You know, so I know. I'm so curious as to I wonder why that is. Well, I think one of the reasons is that they are attempting to get a larger audience back then, whereas a lot of stuff on streamers is uh, because the the algorithm knows you know exactly who to give it to, is going for a, a more niche audience anyway. Okay. Uh, I think I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, do you think that our extremely online culture has made? writing comedy harder because one thing i've noticed more of the last few years is like every time something happens every possible joke has been made about it on twitter uh within an hour and many of them are like exactly the same and i'm just wondering like if i'm a comedy writer and I'm yeah it's it's pushed me into the year 2034 to get <laughs> <laughs> to get a first there crack okay. at jokes yeah <laughs> anything that's that's more recent someone else is going to get to first yeah <laughs> Do you try to? What are your online habits? Are you uh, are you a big Twitter guy or you? Uh, TikTok. You're a your TikTok big guy. TikTok watcher. Yeah. Big, big TikTok. And I ruin my uh, any feed, <laughs> any any time I get on a TikTok that isn't my own feed, it basically turns into recipes within about a half an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I've ruined my daughter's TikTok <laughs> multiple <laughs> times. She's had to delete it and go back on it because. They're just showing various ways of uh, putting a tortilla on three, three eggs and flipping it over or using an air fryer. I don't know. That seems to be all I'm, I'm interested in. <laughs> but you're not, are you a Twitter user? 
No. Okay. Never, never been on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Wow. Yeah. What a, that's healthy. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't know. What's I'm, your secret? What are you doing with all that? I guess you're writing TikTok. very, very famous uh, television shows. With your yeah. Time. Well, I, you know, I'm a parent. I have kids, so <laughs> I have to do something for them sometimes. Um, <laughs> I know you've been asked uh, quite a few times about an office reboot uh, or an office reunion. Uh, I will go ahead and put in my request as well. Um, one thing I've been wondering as I've watched the show for the 15th time over the last year is um, how you'd get away with a lot of those jokes, especially from Michael, like here in 2022. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that when the show was made, we were in a, a different time in terms of people's sensitivities. And I think the show was doing a good job in showing people who maybe weren't sensitive to other people's struggles that their what they thought might be funny actually lands differently on different people. So yeah. that was our intention at the time. Now, of course, it's bigger now, right? So I don't know if people watching it now are sort of in the back of their heads, they're aware that this is an earlier time being depicted. Yeah. You know, but I, I do think that, um, you know, if we were going to redo the show right now, we wouldn't be making the same jokes because everybody, everybody is more sensitized to the things that Michael was not aware of, right? He was very insensitive at that time, but for him to still be that insensitive now would be a willful choice, right? Much more so now. So it would change the character. I think. Yeah, it's funny. I was, I was talking to someone who uh, wrote on Veep, and asking them a similar question, and. And he was telling me that Veep, Veep was a little different because in Veep, they're all supposed to be pretty loathsome characters. Yeah. <laughs> and so having them say insensitive, awful things was sort of fit a little bit more. In The Office, they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty likable characters, even if they have their flaws, as Michael did. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I felt that a little bit about All in the Family, mm. you know, which, which we certainly were very aware of and admired. Uh, you know, you the, the certainly the voice of the show All in the Family is not supportive of the things that Archie Bunker says. Right. I mean, clearly every story is, you know, engineered so that he needs to get a, a blood transfusion from whoever he was just, you know, making disparaging remarks about or whatever. Uh, so clearly the, the show has got a certain point of view. And I think The Office, the show, has has a good point of view. And, you know, when you see the people reacting, there's where the show is telling you, you know, where the, uh, you know, what's, what to be on, what, what position to take. Um, but, you know, Archie also was a dad and there were other aspects to his character as a human being that were likable. And, uh, you know, so maybe, I don't know, I don't know what the point of that is, but, you know, maybe, uh, the humanity of people is still salvageable, even, and yeah. you're always hoping that they'll change their mind. And you know, also I think to some extent it seems that art and entertainment is about depicting the complexity of human beings, and sometimes people are, yeah. you know, say horrible things and do horrible things and believe horrible things, and then those same people also have good qualities. Sometimes they grow up and they grow out of it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if you've seen this debate pop up from time to time on the internet, but I figured I'd ask a, a true authority on the subject. Which of the office characters, if any, do you think would have voted for Donald Trump? <laughs> uh, that's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some people say, you know, there could be some uh, Trump 2016 voters who then were Biden 2020 voters, maybe after four years, they sort of saw the error of their ways. Well, there might be a couple of those. you know, uh, not that I don't have my own opinions, but just there's uh, my impression of the fatigue of the subject matter of Donald Trump yeah. is, is uh, I don't know, as, as a subject for comedy, it seems like it's been examined in an awful lot of different viewpoints and, you know, I'm ready to move on to. That makes sense. Who votes for Putin or whatever the, the new, <laughs> the the next new horrible thing is. Yeah. Well, the, the most explicitly political show you've co-created is Parks and Rec. Um, which I've always thought was the most Obama-era television series of all time, uh, both because it, it literally ran from 
2009 yeah. to 2015. It was our, our whole, both, both terms. Um, but I think it also reflected Barack Obama's political ethos more than any other show I've seen. Uh, one of the most common questions I get from people who look back at Obama's years in office through the lens of the Trumpian hell we've been through and in some ways are still going through is, um, you know, people say, was Obama's hope for America and American politics misplaced? So, so I will turn the question to you. Was Leslie Nope's hope for <laughs> politics and government misplaced? Huh. Um, well, you mean, the, I guess the premise there is that there's an answer to that. Um, I think for the character of Leslie Nope, that's, that's her personality. Yeah. That's, you know, that kind of optimism, I think, is pretty uh, admirable. She started off um, at the beginning of that show, uh, she was pretty much the same level of optimism, but she didn't quite seem as smart about it. And then as the show, as we kind of incorporated Amy Poehler's personality more and, yeah. you know, um, uh, I think she got to be a smart optimist, uh, which was actually, you know, more fun and kind of a better role model probably. Yeah. What were you guys trying to say about politics in that show? You must have talked about it a lot. Yeah, well, um, uh, so my co-creator, Mike Schur, has uh, a lot of, he's like very thoughtful about his, his political beliefs. And uh, so as the show got more uh, and more, you know, mature, I would, I would point to him as his, his viewpoints going through it more. Because uh, I, I went back to work on The Office after a while. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the optimism was a big part of it and the ability of government to be functional and serve people yep. is, uh, is a huge theme. And uh, so I think that's all, yeah, it's all good mean, stuff. I, I think some people, you know, I've seen critics say, like, oh, it was... But people can, you know, Republicans and Democrats and people who disagree can get together and, you know, maybe that. But the way I looked at that show also is, you know, we can disagree with one another. We can have opposing viewpoints, but we all live in this town together. And if we want to get something done and we want to actually make it a place where people want to live, then we've got to figure out a way forward. Um, which well, the I characters still... also had a lot of nobility, I think, to them. And... You know, Ron Swanson was, uh, you know, one of the noble conservatives, I would say, on that show. Yeah. And uh, I, I've um, had a lot of good conservative characters from, I think, General Mark Naird is yeah, uh, a good conservative on Space Force. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's the the... The optimism is is that all there's people of good will, I guess, on all different sides if we can find them. Uh, my last question to every offline guest is, what's your favorite way to unplug, and how often do you do it? You are the first guest I've had on the show. I don't have to unplug. Who doesn't have to <laughs> unplug? Except for TikTok. So, I gotta stop that TikTok. I, I keep guess, seeing that guy pop in and go, you know, you've been watching an awful lot lately. And, I guess, your, I guess your favorite way to... I always un ignore them. Yeah, I guess, I guess your favorite way to unplug from your unplugged life is to go on TikTok and ruin your daughter's algorithm. Yeah, like. yeah. Well, I got my own algorithm now. <laughs> so. That's good. Uh, Greg Daniels, thank you so much for, uh, for joining Offline. Everyone go check out Upload on Amazon. Season 2 is out right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great Thanks, everyone. Great to be here.